you plead guilty as charged? No. No, I don't. I, I don't for several reasons. Uh, although I agree with the idea of uh, quality control, we already have so many things that measure quality in general practice, uh, uh, particularly COF. You may have heard of COF. I know it's dying, but they still expect us to maintain the standard. And I think CQC uh, leaves a lot to be desired. I think the way they measure you, uh, the way they deal with you, uh, the lack of openness, uh, they're supposed to feed back to you at the end of uh, the visit. And um, they only fed back on five issues. Uh, and in their report, which came about four and a half months later, uh, they raised about 30 issues. So we never got a chance to deal with most of the issues they raised in the report. The report wasn't easy to read. At the end of the report, they uh, say actions we asked the provider to take. You read it, they give you two examples, but to understand the actions, you have to read clause this and book that. Uh, you know, it's, it's like reading a, a legal document. Um, with respect to openness, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's not right to criticise you in absentia. I probably, personally, as the lead, uh, had a 10-minute encounter with the GP uh, part of the team. We had a meeting at the beginning, and some of the things I was uh, saying were completely misconstrued. So I was saying, I was saying, for instance, the translation service that's provided, not by GPs, it's provided by NHS England, was inadequate. Somehow that becomes a criticism of my practice. Um, I was saying that when I go on holiday, I still help the practice by looking at results on the computer, so the practice, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's just being helpful. And that somehow became a point of criticism. Would it be better if I just went and had a holiday, enjoyed myself and let the practice, you know, why is that a point of criticism? Um, but do you take on board anything they've said and say, say oh, that, that's fair game, that's yes. a fair comment? Yes. So what is that? What uh, uh, medication reviews, and I would say I challenge any practice that does medication reviews perfectly, including anyone who works on the CQC. Give me half an hour and I will fail them. If they're looking for perfection, I can fail any practice anywhere. The fact is, medication review is a human, uh, humongous task. You know, it, you're dealing with human beings who are not compliant. So with respect to mentally ill patients, you try and get their blood tests done regularly. You have two options. If they won't comply, you can stop their medication. And on one occasion we've done that, we did that, and a patient ended up being sectioned in hospital. So it's kind of difficult. But with respect to lithium, we've got two patients in lithium, and, our, and our, each uh, member of staff has assigned tasks. One of them has to make sure that the lithium blood test is done every quarter. They haven't, okay? So I've, I've uh, failed there. Uh, now, we've got 10,000 patients probably supervising 50, 60, 70,000 medications. Are you going to write the practice off because of two lithium, two patients on lithium? We are one of four practices out of 33 in Sarak who meet all the prescribing incentive criteria. We meet all the targets, one of four. With respect to lots of prescribing measures run by the medicine management team, we are on the top. We are cost effective, we prescribe fewer antibiotics, we prescribe less in general, and we treat more patients than average. So I don't think we're doing that, but to say, oh, therefore, you're not being safe, you know, right, the practice of medicine you know, medication review is not being done safely. Nonsense. It has been done. It's been done for years. And we also use the, the COF still, because it gives us disease, disease registers. What the COF used to demand is that you used a read code for medication review. It's no longer being demanded. Instead, we've got other tasks to do. But it was implied during the visit that we should still be using the read code. So yes, uh, hands up. You know, we're not perfect. We've failed on that. Methotrexate is another drug that requires monitoring. The problem here is it's called shared care. So the hospital ought to do their part, we do our part. Often the hospital do blood tests that don't, don't, don't send to us. So when we invite the patients, they refuse to have the blood tests because we've had them in hospital. So, uh, so what we could have done is chase the hospital to send us, but it's a nightmare. Uh, and what I've done now is I've uh, written to all patients on these drugs, said, 
come in on high water, you have your blood test or no medication. So, but the vast majority of what they criticise us on, I disagree with. You know, they're not being factual, they're not being objective. So a patient in reception who's in his 70s or 80s, when asked, says, oh, well, they don't care about me, I'm too old. So that goes in the report. Where's objectivity? They lean too heavily on, on um, the patient questionnaire. I mean, I know it's a requirement in the NHS, but most rational people tell you it's not a way of measuring quality because it's objective. In fact, it may be um, conversely proportional to uh, quality. So a practice that doesn't dish up sickness willy-nilly, doesn't prescribe or refer on demand, will be less popular. So you're not going to get a good feedback from patients. Uh, what happens now, because one of the things I noticed, it said in the report that you're looking to try and sell the practice. Uh, that's nothing to do with the CQC. I, um, uh, I decided to leave the NHS two years ago uh, because my personal experience, uh, I mean, generally speaking, uh, general practice is under pressure. Uh, the government is investing less, I think 9% less in the last 10 years, whilst demand has more than doubled. And nobody can sustain that. In addition to this national picture, my two practices have been under huge pressure because we built two practices in two years based on promises, written promises by the PCT to be fully and completely supportive of this project. In the event they did not help us, virtually not at all, uh, they imposed an expansion of the building and only offered to pay low rent for 10 years. My mortgages are for 20 years. So the last five years I've had to choose between paying the mortgages and employing doctors. So I've had to pay the mortgages, therefore my wife and I have had to work extremely hard. We see 50 patients a day each. That's not good. It's not good for my health, it's not good for patients. And the NHS is just totally unmoved. So I can't go on strike. I tried to sue the PCT, it's in my contract that I can't sue them. I've been through a long-winded uh, resolution process with them, it's laughable. Uh, and these guys don't give a damn, they're still on fat salaries and my health is being uh, affected. So I've made a decision, I want nothing anymore to do with the NHS. My wife and I are retiring, I will not ever again work for the NHS. So nothing to do with the CQC, but it has an impact on the CQC the CQC issue a Bible, if you like, and the managers are supposed to read it and implement it. I've tried to read it, it's actually not easy to read. The managers find it hard, and I haven't got time to supervise them. So had I, you know, been given all the promises, that, uh, the things that were promised by the ECT, we probably would have passed with flying colours. But I, I insist, I don't think we're that bad, nonetheless. Just go back in a second. Yeah. Um, so what happens with the practice down in Tilbury? Will, that, will there still be a doctor's surgery yes. there? There's no, it won't be shut down? No, it won't be shut of, down, no. no. I mean, we've already taken action. We've sent an action plan to the CQC. In fact, before they came to feed to us, uh, you know, hand the, the report to us, we'd already taken a, a corrective action to please them. Um, and incidentally, when they came to feed back to us, Everybody in the room was wondering what the hell the meeting was about because they refused to discuss the report with me. When I complained to their regional manager, she said apparently I, I, I didn't want to because the area team had a representative. But the area team was asked to leave and still they would not discuss the report. So we never really had a chance to discuss it and correct any mistakes they have made. Um, Do you feel in any way, shape or form you're a victim of a political witch hunt? Personally, I'm not a victim of a political witch hunt in the sense that general practice has been, in general, has been used as a political football. I mean, one of the political leaders was taunted during the election for using the expression weaponise the NHS. We know that. But my practices personally, yes, have been, uh, I believe I'm a victim of uh, victimisation because things were going well until I... Uh, but until I had a conflict with a senior manager at the PCT uh, because I criticised their recruiting Spanish GPs who were well below par and I spent six months trying to train one of them, it didn't work so I, I sacked her and then I was immediately referred to the PAG, Performance Advisory Group and the relationship declined after that. 
And of course they had to withdraw their referral because they couldn't justify it. And in a meeting in which the LMC were present, that particular manager admitted she was doing it for personal reasons because I, I criticised her judgement. Uh, so yes, I believe uh, uh, there's victimisation there, but I don't have the energy to go on fighting. I came into medicine to be a carer. I'm spending more of my time fighting and worrying. I don't need that. There's a world out there. I come from the Middle East. My people are being slaughtered by Islamic ex extremists. I'd rather spend time helping them for free than work for an NHS uh, whom you can't please ever, even when you're doing extremely well, they apparently fail you. Why do I want to work with them? Isn't that a shame after all these years you seem to be going out on quite a bitter down note? It is a shame. It is a shame on, on, on many counts. Even if I say so, I think I'm one of the best GPs around. You won't find any harder working GPs anywhere in Thurrock or in Britain. Now, I think I'm clinically sound. I have trained at least 30 doctors since we built these two buildings. I've made a huge contribution. I've saved the NHS loads of money. When I took over one of the three lists, in one year I saved them £500,000 by wise prescribing. And, and they refused to give me 270000 towards one of the buildings, which I actually earned. I put myself at risk, I put my personal assets at risk to provide two training practices. Their representative came and said, this practice is the best in Thorough. Why do they treat me so badly if it's the best practice in Thorough? Just going back to the political realm, there are a couple of things. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the MP who has successfully returned Jackie Dore Price says she wants, along with David Cameron, to see seven day GPs open for seven days. That's a great yes. idea, isn't it? Oh, it is, but I don't know if you listen to the BBC. Yesterday or the day before, uh, they want to employ 5,000 GPs. Where the hell are they going to come from? We cannot fill the training posts in, in the Eastern Deanery. We're something like 50 short every year. Um, more GPs are retiring early, like myself. Uh, not far from here, at a stone's throw, four partners have retired in a space of a few months. Uh, most of them my age, 57, 58. Why? I would have worked till I was 66 easily, uh, so I'm retiring nine years early. Can the NHS afford more GPs retiring? Can they afford to continue to fail to, with, uh, to recruit, attract GPs, uh, uh, young doctors to general practice? No, but that's, that's been going on for years. And, and nobody knows on what planet NHS managers live because this has not just happened. You know, it's been happening, they've had lots of warning. Look, you're, you're discouraging doctors from becoming GPs and you're discouraging GPs from continuing. Improve it. And they won't. All they do is apply more pressure. Who needs a CQC now? We don't need to be criticised. We need to be supported. You know, if, if, to give you an example, infection control. The PCT employed uh, an infection control nurse. It used to come around once a year. Suddenly the PCT splits into the area team and the CTG, and we won't talk about them yet, that's another disaster area. Um, and it's all done quietly. Now, I didn't know it was my job to have you know, infection control audit. I thought they sent one, I, I only knew if we had a problem. Uh, so why when the uh, general practice is so deprived of funds, are you loading us with more problems? Makes no sense. You just mentioned them very much in passing in the CCG. Um, how, how do you see, differently both of perspective, how do you see the CCG working? Before I go to CCG, I started something <laughs> that BBC actually highlighted how young GPs did not want to become doctors and reminded the nation that more GPs are retiring early. How do I see a CCG? Well, I think this CCG is dysfunctional. I think the idea of CCGs has been evolving just typical of the NHS. They, they release an idea long before it's mature, long before it's fully developed, and they kind of think on their feet. So it was called practice-based commissioning. It was never going to work, but we had to go along with it. We had no choice. Now we've got CCGs. What CCGs are, they are the whipping boy of central NHS. So it's convenient because apparently they have a lot of decide, you know, decision powers but they have to check with the area team. The area team is equivalent to what used to be the Strategic Health Authority. And the CCG is evolving back into what used to be the PCT. So we're going around in circles. I think our CCG is dysfunctional. 
uh, partly because of the makeup of GPs in Thurrock. I think there are lots of old, out of date GPs who should gracefully retire. Uh, and partly because um, the, the idea that you appoint a board by election, it becomes a vote of popularity. Now, you can tell I'm not going to be very popular because I speak my mind. CCG boards members should be appointed on ability, not on popularity. And that is the scourge of thorough CCG. In some areas it has worked because doctors seem to be more sensible. But the doctors in this area are not as sensible as average because they're choosing on popularity, on ethnicity. You know, racism exists in more than one form. It's not just white people discriminating against coloured people. There are coloured people who discriminate against white and other coloured people. Was the, the issue... Just, that, just to... I was on the board. Yeah? I was one of the best prescribers, one of the best referrals. We were appointed to look after a budget to spend it wisely. Nobody would have been more qualified than myself and a couple more practices. So the board had a secret meeting and decided to remove me from the board. I had two choices, to fight it or to leave it. I decided to leave it uh, and later it became obvious to me I can't do anything because the CCG are completely poisoned. They, they just won't approve anything Dr. Shihadi suggests. And I've decided to fight it. There's a complaint going on and the best they can do is appoint someone from within the board who a year later tells me I can't get answers from the members. I've made serious complaints. I'm making complaints that members of the board are abusing their power. Uh, they're not, they haven't got the patient's uh, interest at heart. And all they can do is say to me, I can't get answers. So I go to the area team, I say, how about, oh, I've got too many headaches. So if they'd come to you and said, Grey's Walking Centre, should we keep it open or keep it shut? What would you have said? I've already given uh, uh, um, uh, an answer. I mean, Grey's Walking Centre mainly benefits the GP who sits in that, uh, I forget what they're called, Thorak Health Centre. Uh, I mean, this issue illustrates how idiotic NHS statistics are and how, how they're used. We had a visit to reprimand us because uh, I think more of our patients use the walking centre than average. Um, and then we looked at the figures. They weren't dividing the number of visits by the number of the list size. So we had more patients than uh, a list, uh, a practice that's only one third of our size, of course we'll have more because they have three times as many patients. But I'll cut it short, 80% of the walk-in centre appointments were utilised by people who registered with that practice. So it was an, uh, the walk-in centre was a gift to an already overpaid practice uh, compared with my practice which was uh, £20 per year per patient below average for PMS, below average. So we were on £64 when average was 84 and there were people not far from here, 140. The NHS has this religion called quality. They don't practice it. So you say shut it? I say shut it. Yeah, absolutely. And shut the practice as well because all they did was take patients from local GPs and weaken the practice. So less patients means less money. It means less nursing appointments, less GP appointments. What's the point? And if you, if you remember what it was first called, the... Uh, Equitable Access Centre. E equitable? Who goes there? It's people who have transport who can park. People living in Tilbury and Perfleet can't go there. It's not equitable at all. It actually made general practice more accessible to some people. So if, if or when you, you do um, lead the NHS, you lead the surgeries, um, what's your message? Finally, what's your message to people who are going to stay here remain fighting the good fight at the coalface. What's your message? What's your advice? What are your warnings? Well, I'm selling the, selling the buildings. Mm -hmm. I'm going into partnership with a local practice who, when I retire, will take over from me. In a sense, they don't need a message from me. I'm giving, uh, you know, I'm handing over to, I think, the best practitioner in the region. Uh, I don't think it's fair for me to say who it is uh, in case things don't go the way they should. But uh, I don't have any worries uh, in that respect because I think they're the best practice around. But of course they will have problems like all GPs. There are fewer, well we've mentioned fewer GPs available to recruit, fewer and I think um, they're already doing, doing the best. If I have a message it's not for them, it's for decision makers. Wake up! Wake up! If they're waking up now wanting to appoint 5,000 GPs, where the hell are they going to get them from? We can't train enough. It takes 
on average 10 years to produce a GP from first year in medical school. How are they going to do it now? Of course, they'll probably go to Bulgaria and Romania and ship them over again, as they did from Spain. What problems are we going to have? Language problems, cultural problems, their training is probably not as good as ours. Uh, as usual, politicians use health as a political football. There's lack of sincerity in politics. Uh, and the public just swallow. You know, the public should make a, an unbreakable alliance with their GPs. And what's been happening in, say, in the last 20 years is patient power and GPs have been weakened. GPs and patients, uh, well, patients need GPs, they don't need politicians. And they ought to defend their GPs, look after your GPs, that's what I would say. Dr. Inosheni, mm. thank you very much for your time. You're welcome.